I am Alice Peters and welcome to this latest video which is about discussing the bottlenecks and the advances in the downstream processing of virus particles and virus-like particles. Now here you can see like a general diagram when we look at for instance proteins and monoclonal antibodies on which I've done a previous video and that process is quite well understood. So viral therapies is, is quite an emerging area and that also means that the downstream processing is not that well understood. And particularly here you can see like in orange, uh, what are the steps that we really need to have a look at and what can we optimize in order to make the process uh, more cost effective, but also to give a higher yield because the yield typically doesn't exceed like 30% uh, in terms of the recovery of the virus particles that we get in the end. Now one particular area is the affinity chromatography steps, whereas protein A chromatography is very well established, for instance, for proteins and for monoclonal antibodies, which I, I discussed in a previous video. Sometimes we need inactivation steps uh, for the virus, and then also just the physical removal of the compounds that we need to add are things that I'll come back to later in this video. Now what are the application of these virus particles or sometimes VLPs which are virus-like particles? So let's just first discuss because in most of the cases we don't work with the actual virus itself. You know this also from vaccination that tends to be an inactivated form of the virus. But virus-like particles are virus-derived structures that make up one or more different molecules and they mimic the size and the form of a virus particle. But, and this is the most important bit, they lack the genetic material, and that does not make them infectious. Um, so that means, as you can see in the image here, that if they have a hollow shell, that can facilitate a lot of, well, it can carry a certain cargo. And you can use this for a lot of delivery of drugs, but also for things like DNA, RNA, and proteins. Um, so that gives a lot of uh, opportunities in how we can get things uh, at the right place. The first VLP-based vaccination, and this was for Hep B, was approved by the FDA already in 1986. And so there's been a lot of other uh, vaccines since, and therefore there's an increased interest in how we can use these virus-like particles. But one of the main bottlenecks in terms of the application has actually not been the production, but the downstream processing. And this is what I will discuss next. Now, the general downstream processing uh, is somewhat different than what you've seen for proteins. So first we start off with producing uh, the virus-like particles. So this is typically in your bioreactor. Um, then we need to harvest it and we need to clarify it. And we further need to concentrate it. Now, there's a lot of other things that are involved in this. And the problem is that when you infect your cell line, is when you, when you start producing uh, these viruses, you might have cells that contain nothing. So they're hollow. They can only contain the partial bit of what you want. And so there's a lot of other things that you need to look at. Uh, and then often you will need to lyse the cells. So you have a lot of debris and organelles um, and other carriers. So the, the first initial step tend to be either centrifugation or ultrafiltration in order to remove the bulk um, of these contaminants. So after I've co you've concentrated, you might need to inactivate that using either UV light or some chemicals, which then again need to be separated out. So typically we do have some kind of nuclease treatment, uh, benzonase is a typical one, uh, and I'll come back to that, how that kind of reduces and digests DNA and RNA. This is a very costly step, for particularly in this downstream process. Then we need to further purify this, which again typically involves some steps, but here we mainly are, are looking at, rather than just centrifugation, looking at chromatography. Uh, so we need to purify it and uh, to further remove other DNA and RNA, some proteins and some lipids. And then there's a final polishing step and to make sure that also the defective particles, because as I've mentioned before, uh, some of the particles might not contain uh, the cargo that you want or they're only partially incomplete. Um, so in essence, polishing step, and then in order to uh, make sure that the product is safe for use, typically a sterile filtration step uh, is done at the end. Um, so besides a health and safety implications, this is also to make sure that you can store it for a longer period of time. Now, some of the bottlenecks uh, in here is that you need to retain the biological activity. So you're definitely somewhat limited um, to typical processes that you could use for proteins, for instance, um, as these things are much more delicate uh, than other biomolecules. 
So what you typically don't see and what is often used in other downstream processing involves steps around uh, precipitation and flocculation. And here you can see the majority is based on either centrifugation, filtration, or chromatography steps. Now, some of these bottlenecks in this downstream processing, first of all, the removal of the host DNA is complicated. And there's also very strict guidelines in terms of health and safety of residual levels of DNA. So here I've given a typical example of 10 nanograms per dose, uh, but this can be even more strict uh, for certain applications. So it depends on the application that you, you want for this. Because of these very strict health and safety uh, regulations, that usually necessitates this, this treatment with nucleases, and this is the example of the benzonase. And this is specifically designed to digest DNA or RNA into fragments of less than five base pairs. And this is a very um, time-consuming and it's also a very costly step. Uh, but again, you can imagine if you start to fragment things that can lead to even more that you need to remove in the end. Because this batch, uh, this, this downstream process is not that well understood, there's a large amount of batch to batch variation. And therefore, it also means in terms of the monitoring and the quality control, this is really an essential step uh, where it needs to be monitored much more closely compared to other processes. A part of this, this long downstream process, as you can see, uh, is that you do lose a lot of the material. So actually viral carbon 30% are considered acceptable and typically you don't see more than between 30 and 40%, which is much lower compared to production of other proteins and therapeutics. Now here I wanted to give you like a short example uh, using adenovirus because that's the most commonly used viral factor. Uh, in this image, you can kind of see what this looks like. Um, so this is typically associated with a cold virus, so it's relatively harmless. And it's about 90 to 100 nanometers, and it is a non-enveloped virus. Um, the ones here that you see also have lentivirus and AAV are typically other you know, used viruses uh, that are used as vectors. Now looking at the image on the right, uh, the first step is actually the production. Uh, and there we need to infect the cell line to produce the recombinant virus. Once we've done that, we need to harvest it and we need cell lysis to remove the DNA. Um, well, you, you don't need cell lysis all the time because sometimes it can be expressed outside the cell, but generally you will need cell lysis, uh, which further complicates um, the downstream processes. We then look at filtration steps. So this can be a couple of filtration steps. Usually it's not just one filter and to further remove proteins and DNA. Now, where the next step is where oh yeah, there's actually a couple of different options, and I will discuss about how we can simplify this process. The next step typically involves uh, chromatography using anion exchange. And this is because this adenovirus has an acidic isoelectric point, so it means you can use it in capture mode and relatively easy to capture things. Um, however, there is a drive towards replacing this with other uh, options. So, for instance, if we would use membranes, uh, which are disposable, so that's, again, a lot easier in terms of sterilization, they also have a much higher capacity and faster flow rates. And so more sophisticated membrane techniques are a way of how we can look at potentially replacing these chromatography steps. Now, usually, then, the, the next step is the polishing step. Uh, to further remove some impurities, which typically involve other types of chromatography that separates based on other concepts rather than charge. And then finally, the formulation where, uh, and I talked about the sterile filtration before, but this also might involve addition of salts and buffers, uh, which are important to guarantee safety, stability, and also how we're going to store it and how we're going to package it in the end. Um, so there are some steps, which I said in the beginning, that are quite well understood. Uh, but there's also particularly the steps around where you look at removal uh, of, for instance, certain impurities, where there's a couple of different options. And we really need to further explore what the best options would be. So what advances can be made within this downstream process? Generally, and I've discussed this a couple of times, there will be a move towards continuous systems, simply to make it more cost effective, but also to start to improve the yield, which is relatively low. There's also a necessity to further reduce the number of steps, because you can see this is quite a cumbersome process, and using uh, certain filtration techniques, we might be able to combine certain steps. And particularly if we use affinity chromatography, here I said that we might be able to change this with a membrane, uh, but 
there is a step where we do primary concentration and we further do purification. Um, so for instance, chromatography lends itself very well to combine these two together. Um, so there are different routes of how we can kind of simplify it. There are also other more modern chromatography uh, methods, uh, such as things as, for instance, monolives, and they can be improved uh, to further adjust this downstream process. But what's really lacking at the moment, and that's what we see the most happening, is that there is a need for high throughput screening assays, uh, because this process is not very well understood, and we need more computational tools in order to combine the two together and to get a better understanding generally. Now what's the summary of this? Here you can see a nice image of how complicated it actually would be for these virus-like particles. So we can see something in red, you can clearly see uh, that is incomplete, so there's nothing within um, the virus itself. In white it's more or less complete, and blue is what you're looking after. So the separation, you have a lot of defective particles, so you're probably dealing with a lot more compared to, for instance, just separating out proteins. So these VLPs are important factors in healthcare, uh, but the downstream process is a bottleneck for commercialization, especially because there will be a higher demand for uh, viral vaccinations, for instance. We really need to start looking at making this more cost effective and also improving the yield. And a lot of these complications come from the fact that we are somewhat limited in terms of the processes we can use, as we need to make sure that we retain the biological activity. So it is expecting that the main improvements here will come by further reducing the number of, of steps that we use, particularly the purification steps, in order to streamline this process. And once this can be established, and also with better tools and better computational models, then this is really a route forward towards using these virus-like particles in important healthcare applications. Thanks for watching and do have a look at the, the rest of this playlist where we look at other ways of how we can improve the downstream processing in the pharmaceutical industry.